What's up, y'all? This is Chitty Bang, and I'm on the Renegade Millionaire Show, the podcast that profiles entrepreneurs, founders, and CEOs. Join us as we go one-on-one inside the hearts and minds of some of our generation's best and brightest. And now, introducing your host, my friend, Sun Group Wealth Partners Managing Director, CNBC and Forbes.com contributor, Winnie Sun. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in again. It is Winnie Sun, your host at the Renegade Millionaire Show. We are uh, filming or taping, I should say, in beautiful tune-in studios here in SoCal. And I'm excited to have you back. As you know, I am Managing Director and Financial Advisor at Sun Group Wealth Partners. And you can find me at winniesun.com. Where I, my, actually, I'm really excited about my next Forbes piece, so make sure to... Um, Sign in so you can get connected and you can read that. And with that, I'm super excited about our guest today. Um, If you haven't done so already, make sure to bookmark the show so you can keep um, reaching out with us. So today I thought we would take a a little bit of a segue, being that, you know, right around the corner is July 4th and Independence Day. There's a lot of things that we're so grateful for being in the beautiful U.S. and uh, very much so about all the men and women who serve this country and serve us well and take such good care of us and make sure that our beautiful nation is safe. Um, did you know that as of as of September 2014, that there are 2.7 million American veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars? I just thought that number was huge. Um, and according to Rand, at least 20% of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans have PTSD or depression. So this is really real, and it's affecting a lot of families. And with that, I wanted to take this moment to not only to recognize, but also to interview my next guest, who I'm really excited to introduce to all of you. His name is Johnny Joey Jones. You got it, three J's. And with that, welcome so much, Joey, to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Thanks for the wonderful lead-in. And um, you're right, there's some astonishing statistics in the, on the situation with our current um, veterans out there. Um, but, you know, they're doing a lot of great things as well, so it goes both ways. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I, mean, I think when, when I read your bio, I got very inspired and very touched going through everything because I thought, you know, here's a young man. You were born July 21st, so this is actually July is your birthday month, so happy birthday to you. Born in 1986 right, <laughs> in Dalton, Georgia, right? And you graduated high school, started college. I'm going to read a little bit for our audience here. Uh, enlisted in the Marine Corps. Because you felt that you needed more discipline, is that right? That's absolutely right. I jokingly tell people I was just smart enough to realize how dumb I was acting, and um, <laughs> it, you know it was time to go up a little bit. I graduated high school at seventeen, and um, you know to the son of a brick mason and my mom and cleaned houses that both worked really hard, and I knew that if I didn't do something to get myself on track, I would end up in a in a situation where I worked really hard for not a lot of reasons. So mm. the Marine Corps was, was calling, and I came I came and answered that call. Oh, amazing, amazing. And you must have made an incredible uh, community of friends, and you had a great purpose that you were serving, correct? I felt that way. You know, a lot of people enlist for a, a ton of different reasons. I, I'll be the first to say that my initial reason for li- enlisting was, was more selfish than not. I wanted to get out of a small town and and provide for myself and not rely on my parents. Mm -hmm. But quickly, very quickly, um, through boot camp and your your experiences, even that first year, you understand that you're now part of something much bigger than yourself. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you understand that you're one of very few people who get that honor. Yeah, absolutely. So you actually, I'm going to so continue on. I mean, you've got, you had an eight-year career with the Marines. You served in combat from in 2007 and 08 in Iraq, and you retired as a bomb tech from the U.S. Marines. I mean, incredible journey. I got a, I read this part. It just, it just shocked me. So in August of 2010, you were deployed to Afghanistan where you disarmed over 85 IEDs. I had to ask my husband, what's an IED? Um, but I guess it's a homemade bomb, right? You s- Absolutely. The, the term is improvised explosive device and mm-hmm. They come in a gamut of different, you know, situations, and really what it comes down to is either a, a home chemist has uh, taken some pretty 
easy to get chemicals and make something explosive out of it. Or that's taking conventional ordnance and replace the fusing system with something that uh, is called victim operated. So they'll take a piece of artillery, put it in the ground, and replace the fuse with something that when you step on it, it sets it off, or when you pass through. Um, they're really, really simple in Afghanistan. They were more complex in Iraq. And the simpler something is, if you've ever played a game Mousetrap, mm -hmm. the more effective and efficient it is, and sometimes the harder for us to find it. Wow, that's crazy. It's like, I mean, these these homemade bombs, and not only that, if you think about it, not only are they, they like you said, it's like mousetrap, but because they probably all looked differently, right? And they looked very benign, yeah. then that's what made them well, so dangerous? Yeah, you know, uh, depending on the area you're in, they, they don't have the same battle lines we have. So you may see the same type of IED your entire deployment, or you might see a dozen different types if you're like my deployment and you move around the different areas. Um, what makes them so hard to find and disarm is that they're made with household kind of material. Like, like anything that'll make like... a sound or a light come on wow. can cause an IED to go off. And a lot of times they can get all the way down to non-metallic components. And we use a metal detector as our primary way to find it. So right. when wow. you add that equation, it's a little tough. Yeah, and this, so, I mean, in, in Afghanistan, these were created by the Taliban, right? Well, you know, what is the Taliban? It's kind of like, um, uh, it's, you know, our government can't define that always. Uh, it's made, they're made by local people. They're made by farmers. Sometimes they're made by people that come in from Europe. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're made, um, you know, by, by people that come in from Saudi Arabia or Iran uh, because they believe in something, and that something would be chilling and, and harming Americans and in, in Arab nations. So uh, there's a gambit of actors when you have this war in Afghanistan going in 2010 from all different countries, mostly in the area we were in. Mm -hmm. it, it would be, quote-unquote, local people, but not from that exact area. And actually how we found all mm -hmm. of our IEDs, or most of them, mm -hmm. was that we were making life so much better for the local people, mm -hmm. they were outing those that had come in to fight us. Um, wow. And really what it comes down to is we're, we're not fighting a, a war of attrition mm -hmm. we're fighting a war of ideology and so what we had to do was um really spread the idea that hey we're here because if, when we're not here you're living in under sharia law mm -hmm. and there's all these you know socio-political things that you know these guys harvest poppy they mm -hmm. can't sell that on the open market so mm -hmm. the taliban goes and sells it they may get dollars on, on the pound mm -hmm. to where we bring in wheat and they get all the money back. So, you know, you kind of open their eyes there and, hey, there's a lot of political views on the war, but I can only tell you what I was up to and what right. we were Yeah. Wow. So there's so that's something that, you know, you don't hear too much about, but there's so much education that you give back to the community so that they embrace you, they can help you and become your eyes and ears in the community, right? Yeah, absolutely. We're there for one purpose, to make sure the Taliban isn't able to do what they did on 9-11 anywhere mm -hmm, in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and if that's where they live and if that's where they're choosing to recruit their people and earn their money, then, then we're there to stop that from happening. What we couldn't allow, and for the most part didn't allow, is the local and peaceful people of Afghanistan to be harmed daily because of it. So our missions quickly shifted to um, the welfare of the people of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. um, and that became a part of accomplishing our own mission. Wow, and so amazing! It was like uh, I guess it was a lot like the they they did a movie some called Hurt Locker. I guess that kind of gives us a visual, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, really. you know, I sort mean of. that movie does a <laughs> it does a great job of showing the intensity, mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, it, it's it's very inaccurate, and that that's okay. Um, that's okay. Even in that's Iraq, but definitely in Afghanistan. Yeah, you're not using a bomb suit, and in Afghanistan, we weren't able to use a robot because we couldn't get them there. So it, it changed things a lot, and you don't have renegade guys running off base. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe Bo Bergdahl as an exception, but no, you know, it, it, it's Hollywood, and that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. At least it gets people engaged in, in paying attention, right? Exactly. Just like Mark's story and Chris's story, people know more and care more. Yeah. about our veterans and what they go through because of those stories and the movies that follow. Yeah, I mean, we're talking 85 IEDs that you disarmed. I mean, we're talking several thousands of bulk explosives. Like this is this is like the real deal that you had that you you basically disarmed and saved so many people. 
from death because of it. It's huge, right? At su such a young age, does it ever get to you like, oh my goodness, I saved so many people? Well, you know, I'm thankful. I'm thankful every day that um, that the Marines I was I was responsible for keeping safe stayed safe. I was one of a two man team. Mm -hmm. We worked 85 IEDs. There were um, 38 two man teams all over that part of the country doing just as many IEDs every day as we were. So. Um, you know, I'm, I'm one of 86 of us that deployed. Um, we had a great time, uh, you know, doing our job. There were days that were bad and we would lose someone, mm -hmm. of course. But um, you in the, in the middle of a long deployment, you don't, you know, fix your focus there. You really have to stay focused on the next IED, the next patrol, the next call. And um, along the way, you're educating other Marines and soldiers, and, you know, what a lot of people don't understand, we've hit on very heavily already, is most of the time I put my life on the line to disarm an IED mm -hmm. so that a local wouldn't get hurt or killed, especially their children. Mm -hmm. um, it, is a, it is an ideological war. The Taliban aren't dumb. Mm -hmm. They didn't care so much if they killed us as if they killed the local people, because if the local people got killed, they came back and blamed us. So, right. you know, the people we were trying to save more often than not for the people that live in the areas we were deployed to. So it was, it was you know, uh, an incredible experience. I'm greatly thankful that we found and disarmed as many IDs as we did. Yeah. You know, it's very unfortunate that I did step on one myself, and in resulting of Marine Engineer Corporal Daniel Greer lost his life, I lost my legs, and, um, you know, that's such as war. I know, incredible. I mean, you definitely gave up so much for these people that you were trying to save. Like you mentioned before, you lost both your legs above the knees, and you severely injured your arm as well, right? Absolutely. I've got a, I've got a loss of finger, and uh, I've got a really gnarly set of scars and skin graft on one of my arms. But um, it went from not working to almost fully functional, so I'm incredibly thankful there. My wrists are fused, and that just means when I do push-ups, it's really cool, and I have to do them on my knuckles, but oh, beyond wow. those two things, it's, <laughs> it's incredible. taking life in moderation, and it's fun. It's a good life. Yeah, I mean, this is what I love about reading your story, and now talking to you, I'm even more touched by your enthusiasm and your charisma and just how still so optimistic you are. I mean, so many young people, they get upset because, you know, like, you know, their their car gets taken away from their parents, you know, or they're told that they can't go out on this date. But here you are, you served your country, you lost two of your, you, know, you lost your legs. This is huge for a young man, right? And yet you've got this, this enthusiasm about you. Where do you get this energy? Where do you get this, this, this strength in you? Um, you know, I, I would love to come up with something very poetic and possibly life-changing, but really what it comes down to is it's just not really hard to to experience life and look at it and go, wow, what if I weren't here? So I tell people, hey, I didn't lose my legs. I got a second chance at life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's really what happened. Um, we lost literally dozens of Marines from our 86 that deployed. I wear... 27 names on my right wrist from one deployment, from one year. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't take long to say, hey, if I'm having a bad day, I can look down at these names and know that I owe it to them to live and live well, enjoy this life, be thankful for it. Mm -hmm. But it is unique. I don't expect an 18-year-old to see life the way I do. Mm -hmm. That's unfair of me. I don't put that on him or her. Mm -hmm. I expect them to be upset over these things because, you know, Life is relative. You only know what you know. Mm -hmm. But it's still my duty to go out and explain to these 18-year-olds that are willing to listen my experiences and how much I do appreciate life and hopefully share some of that with them. Mm -hmm. I got this perspective serving this country, so I only owe it to them to give it back. Oh, amazing. Amazing. I love you. You're so amazing. So let's talk about, like, let's talk about the peer visit program. Because I can see this is this just oozes out of your blood. What, I mean... <laughs> You know, you so you you visit and mentor other severely wounded heroes for emotional support. I mean, it doesn't get better than Joey. I can see you walking in a hospital. <laughs> I mean, I can see this is I can see you walking into the hospital, kind of like Snow White and the birds and everything. He sings like, "Oh, Joey's here," you know, because you know they're probably so depressed and and so they just feel so small and and, and forgotten until you walk in. Well, I appreciate that. If I did, if that scenario were true, it'd probably be more like a Will Ferrell case <laughs> where there was more comedy than stoicism. Or, but, you know, really what it came down to 
um, back in 2010, if you, if you look at the statistics, we went from maybe five or ten amputees in Ward 5 or or 53, depending on if you're at Bethesda or Walter Reed, to 50 or 80. I mm-hmm. think we got up to 80 at one time. Mm-hmm. There were so many Joneses there at one time mm-hmm. that uh, we had to uh, put our first name on the door instead of last name. Wow. So what that really came down to was statistically Afghanistan had simpler IEDs and a lot more of them. Mm-hmm. And in 2010, 2008 to 2010, the president sent 40,000 more troops there, most of which were Marines. Mm-hmm. Um, to really break it down in a simple way, a lot of guys and gals lost limbs or their life. Marines, soldiers, sailors, airmen that were injured went to one of two places. They either went to Walter Reed, mm-hmm. which was ran by the Army and serviced the Army and Air Force, or they went to Bethesda, a few miles away, which was ran by the Navy and serviced the Marine Corps and Navy. Okay. And what happened at that time was that everyone who used prosthetic limbs, mm-hmm. when they were ready for it, went over to Walter Reed. So you had all these Marines and sailors, and mm-hmm. at the time, more Marines than anyone were getting hurt. Mm-hmm. They would be at Bethesda and have excellent care, and I mean wonderful care. But mm-hmm. they never saw someone wearing prosthetics or using a prosthetic arm because that was over at Walter Reed. So when I went through my recovery, somebody showed up, told me, quit feeling sorry for myself, look at my legs, I'm going to do well, you're going to do well. Mm-hmm. And it changed my life. Mm-hmm. So when I got over to Walter Reed and put all this together, I thought, wow, why don't we just go back and show those guys every day? Mm-hmm. In my job field, the EOD field, was getting hurt the worst. So I was over there all the time visiting my brothers as they were coming in anyway. Mm -hmm. So it all kind of added up. And um, so we we commandeered a a bus that would do a wheelchair lift, and we took guys that were just barely uh, in a wheelchair, but they could wear prosthetics, all the way to guys. Dan Knossin was a Navy SEAL that was a Paralympian on prosthetic legs and everywhere in between. And we visited for months. And finally, that got recognition by higher Marine Corps. I was asked to speak to all the sergeant majors in the Marine Corps about the state of our wounded warriors. And that just kept rolling and rolling until I was so you met the in president. front of the entire Marine Corps. <laughs> yeah. And then you met the yeah. president of the United States, right? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, the commandant of the Marine Corps took a liking to me. Um, he enjoyed <laughs> my enthusiasm and invited me to, to dine with the president. Um among other things. So that was really awesome. <laughs> very cool, very cool. And then you you attended Georgetown University, yeah? I mean, really great school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. so the, the story goes, um, you have dinner with the president, and you get excited. You want to be more. <laughs> you want to do more. Um, perhaps I was doing enough already, but I wanted to do more. So as my recovery wrapped up, I found myself kind of um, – bargaining for a fellowship with Capitol Hill, which at the time was a little unheard of for mm-hmm. an enlisted Marine. It was reserved for officers. So right. I kind of bought a suit and went up there and found a place <laughs> and interned. Um, the Marine Corps found out about it, and before they could get on to me, the, the congressmen up there were so happy I was there, they had to <laughs> let me keep doing it. It was kind of funny. But all that, uh, I realized uh, my cart was so far in front of my horse that I had to do some homework. So I went back to school. Mm-hmm. Um, I was actually already doing community college, but I found my way into Georgetown University. Mm-hmm. After a year on Capitol Hill, I, I did another year and a half at Georgetown. Graduated there, and um, by that time, I had found an organization called the Boot Campaign, and I had decided if I really wanted to change society, change America, or leave a mark on how we treat our veterans, mm-hmm. that I needed to get away from Capitol Hill, out in the private sector, and with the nonprofit. So I found Boot Campaign in Texas. So in 2014, I Graduated school and picked up and moved out here to Texas, and um, the rest, as they say, is history. Yeah, tell us about that. Let's talk about that. Boot campaign. Can you describe and explain what you do? The easiest way to explain boot campaign is to tell you how I found out about boot campaign. Okay. I was riding down the road in my vehicle mm-hmm. at Sirius XM Radio, and Joe Nichols, the country music singer, came on and was talking about a music video he did with an MPT in it. Mm-hmm. And they were wearing combat boots to the whole video, and that was because they were supporting boot campaign. Mm-hmm. He said it was a military nonprofit here in Texas, and that the whole purpose was to raise awareness and eventually provide support for America's veterans. Mm-hmm. So I did a little research. I wrote them a letter, got communication with them. They were still really small back in 2010-11. And uh, before you know it, I was going to an event. They had a motorcycle ride with a full cast of Sons of Anarchy, and they asked me to come out, participate, and speak. <laughs> um, and from there, I kept volunteering as I finished school and finished my time on Capitol Hill. Wow. As a volunteer, I became a hero ambassador along with Mark Luttrell, 
at the time, Chris Kyle, and unfortunately, you know, Chris was murdered a few years later. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So that is boot campaign. So what we do, starting with Marcus Luttrell, Joe Nichols, and Governor Perry, Mm -hmm. now almost a thousand celebrities in boots, Mm -hmm. we get celebrities, public figures, people of influence to wear a pair of combat boots, take a picture, do some videos, and show their fans in America that they support our military, that they support those who have raised their right hand and support this country. Oh, my gosh. We take that picture, that video. We market it on social media. Now we're doing traditional media. We're doing talk shows, radio shows. Mm -hmm. And and we're really getting the message out there that supporting our military is not supporting any particular war, but it's supporting that class of Americans, that very small class of Americans Mm -hmm. who are willing to lay their lives down or years of their lives to defend this country. And then we promote patriotism among all Americans. Be patriotic. Be proud of this country. Mm-hmm. Do more than don the red, white, and blue on 4th of July. Mm-hmm. Understand why we're different and that we are different and contribute to it. We're not mm-hmm. perfect. We're not the only country that tries every day to be more perfect. Right. Um, and then lastly, we provide support. We raise money mm-hmm. and we offer assistance programs at different tiers to any veteran or service member who served honorably. That's incredible. Let me ask you this, Joey. So those of us that are listening, like, like I don't know about you, but I really want to get myself some combat boots now. Where do we go about getting these combat boots? Exactly. I almost missed the key element here, combat boots. Yeah. The boot campaign. Yeah. So what we do is we have combat boots. We have 16 different styles, and Ooh. some of those come in different colors, black or tan. And you can go to bootcampaign.org. Okay. And we have a shop there. Or we have a Shopify store. You can check out all of our combat boots. And we also have a killer line of T-shirts. And we've just added a few things like hats and patches. All of this stuff, any proceeds we make off of it, funds our assistance program. So there's no for-profit venture here. The whole goal is to get more people wearing combat boots to show their support. And in return, we raise money to help these service members and veterans that, you know, need a, next, need a helping hand along the way. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of fun. We have events all over the country. You can wear them to work, wear them with your suit, wear them with your dress, stand out wearing them. Ask somebody, or when somebody asks you why you're wearing them, that's your golden opportunity to talk about our veterans and why you support them. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. I can see. So, you know, here in Southern California, guys, I know it's summertime, but put on those combat boots and put on that T-shirt that you could support. That's amazing. Incredible. I mean, Wow, Joey, you have done so much. And how old are you right now? I'm coming up on 29. So oh, maybe goodness. I'll be 29 and holding for a Just a baby. <laughs> okay, those of you who are listening, you're probably thinking, goodness gracious. Okay, so I guess my challenge to all of you that are listening is go out and get some boots. This is incredible. Joey here with his, with his, um, com- well, he can't wear, com- you, do you wear boots? You can't, right? I do. I have prosthetic legs. Amazing. And um, some of our boots are lightweight and flat on the hill, and I can throw those on and take off. Wow. Awesome. You're going to have to send us a photo so we can go ahead and push this online. Well, let me ask you this. Let's go ahead and give us some of your your website you gave us. So let's get all – how can people stay in touch with you? Yeah, it's an easy day. So on Twitter and Instagram, we're at Boot Campaign. Mm -hmm. I'm at Johnny underscore Joey. Okay. And then on Facebook, it's simple, Boot Campaign. That's us. Um, and like I said, uh, bootcampaign.org. Um, and if you want to send in an email, it's info at bootcampaign.com. We'd love to field your questions. We have a personal response to anyone that writes in. There no, nothing's automated in our world. Um, we're here because we want more Americans to understand and appreciate our service members in this country. So, of course, we're going to take your calls, take your emails, hopefully take your boot orders and get you out to one of our events all over the country. Amazing. Thank you, Joey. Well, thank you on so many fronts, but thank you for just being you. You are one incredible hero. You truly are the definition of hero on, on every front. Thank you. Well, okay, now you know why Joey has a Purple Heart amongst many, many other uh, service awards. So he is a real deal at 29 years old. So those of you listening, I hope you'll participate with me and also get you your boots and your T-shirts and all that good stuff. And if you do me a favor and send me a photo uh, via social media, you can reach me at Twitter at SungroupWP, uh, website's winningsun.com. I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn, 
uh, Facebook, all that good stuff. So I hope you'll send me that photo and I'll send you a thank you from me. And with that, uh, thank you, Joey, for participating and being on the show. It was a true honor. I feel like we've been friends for a very long time. <laughs> thank you so much for all the kind words. And um, no, it really has been my pleasure to talk to you today. And I appreciate your enthusiasm about what we're up to. And Really, we're a good news story, and uh, we just truly enjoy these opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. Thank you so much. Woohoo! So had so much fun. And most importantly, happy July 4th to you, and happy Independence Day to you, too. Um, and with that, if you need anything else, just reach out. And those of you who are listening, thank you so much for tuning in. It's such a pleasure having you, and I appreciate you tuning in. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.